So welcome to the Wednesday weekly webinar. And today's webinar will feature Chandra Zeman Belinsky as well as Julie Wagendorf. But before we get started, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of things. I am, by the way, Julie Garden Robinson. I'm a food and nutrition specialist here on campus. And I've been working with all these great people in setting up 10 webinars. So this is our third one. Next week is another one you'll be interested in. It's about food law and trying to figure out regulations and all this big puzzle that we have. And that will be given by Dave Sikowski. Same time, same place. Uh, following that, if you like wine, you might be interested in listening to Steve Sagasser. And he is in Grand Forks. The following week will be Holly Mobby. And she's going to talk about herbs from growing to packing. So that should be very interesting. Um, following that will be Kim Koch, who is the Feed Production Center Manager at the Northern Crops Institute. You're probably familiar at least a little bit with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Kim has taken a lot of training in that area. On the 12th of April, Esther McGinnis will be talking about fruit flies, spotted wing Drosophila to be exact. So please join us for that. And lining up this 10 webinar series will be Cliff Hall talking about canning low and high acid foods. And finally, Todd Weinman, who's in Fargo at the Cass County office, talking about introducing youth to gardening. So I certainly welcome all of you to these. If there are some that you won't be able to attend, but you're interested in the topic, please know that we are archiving all of these webinars on the Field to Fork website. And that website continues to grow in terms of the materials that we're putting on it. If you see anything you like that you want to use in, say, you um, do some work at a farmer's market, go ahead. You can run copies. You don't have to ask permission to use the material. So please use that. That's meant for you. Um, we've already gone through some of the logistics in doing our mic tests. But you'll right now are all in the listening mode. And we practice typing in the little chat pod. And I'm going to keep an eye on the chat pod just in case um, you have questions along the way, and I'll let uh, Chandra know if you have a question for her in case she's not watching that chat pod. Um, yeah, the website for accessing the archives actually will come to you through the survey that we send out after this. And if you just remember NDSU Field to Fork, it will take you if you Google that. So good question. See, I keep I have one eye on one spot and one eye on the other. <laughs> Um, we do have a survey, a very short survey at the end of the webinar. I really would appreciate getting your responses. Um, I was the one who wrote the grant. I write the reports. And I really need responses to our survey so we can show the grant funding agency that what we did was, um, was received. So that's very short. And to make it worth your while, I also do some prize drawings. So I'll go ahead and fill that out when it comes to you. If for some reason that you weren't pre-registered and you access this in another way, uh, just send me a note, uh, Julie Garden Robinson, and I will send you the direct link. And I think we also have it on the uh, Field to Fork website with the archived webinars. So it's just a special plea, I guess, that you do fill out that survey. And you also have the opportunity there to tell us about future topics that you will be interested in. And Bob just popped it in. Thank you, Bob. So there you go. So now it's my pleasure to introduce a couple of people who will be our speakers today. And Chandra zeman Volinsky is the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent in Burley County with NDSU Extension Service. And her passion for food safety has grown through the years with the influence of her work experiences. After her undergraduate studies, she started at General Mills as a food science technician in R&D, research and development, developing frozen food products with Pillsbury and Totino's. And then she furthered her food science and food safety background with Cloverdale Foods, where she eventually transitioned into the director of quality assurance and food safety. And she's built food safety programs with both employers, and she enjoys helping others understand why it's essential to respect food safety. And we're really happy to have her as one of our extension agents. So she can be very helpful to you in that whole Burley County area. Our special guest 
is Julie Wagendorf, and she is the fairly new, I believe, um, director of Food and Lodging. She replaced Ken and Bullinger recently, and that position is with the North Dakota Department of Health. As a licensed environmental health practitioner, Julie has worked for the Division of Food and Lodging since 2012 and has an additional 10 years of experience in epidemiology while working for the Division of Disease Control. Prior to joining the State Health Department, she worked in the food manufacturing industry directing food safety, microbiological monitoring, quality assurance, and sanitation. And Julie is a, an NDSU grad with both her bachelor's degree and master's degree, as well as computer support database management from BSC. So you have two very qualified people to, to uh, deliver today's talk. And again, if you have questions, put them in the chat pod, and I will stop talking and turn it over to Chandra. Okay, great. Can you hear yes. me, Julie? Just double checking here before I go. Okay, well, thank you so much for that warm welcome, and I want to extend that to everybody who's joined. I am delighted to see that we have quite a few people join, joining us today um, over the topic of ultimately food safety. We actually have quite a few subjects throughout the series here focusing on food safety, and, you know, I always like to talk about the subject. Today, we'll be, we will be focusing on what regulations apply when preparing food for the public, just as the slide indicates here. And so really, this is for those of you out there that might have a great recipe that you want to share with others. So maybe you want to sell it to uh, at the farmer's market. Maybe you want to rent a truck to sell at the state fair. Maybe you want to sell your awesome recipe on the internet. Well, how do you do that safely? Where do you start and stay within the regulations? I've always been told that regulations can, you know, translates to the word law or even just rules. Sometimes those are kind of scary words, but, you know, just to stay within the rules when you take your delicious product to, uh, to market or even to, just to share. I also want to thank Julie so much, Julie Wagendorf, uh, again, the Director of Food and Lodging with the North Dakota Department of Health because she amps up my my confidence here if I'm not able to answer something, especially as it pertains to taking a product to market in North Dakota, hopefully she'll be able to, to find us the answer to chime in today. So thank you, Julie. Okay, let's get going here. So again, today's topic, and as I mentioned it and introduced it here, we can kind of take the regulatory requirements for foods uh, to two different subjects. So you pick what path you want to go down with your product today. We'll kind of cover both, I hope. So you either want to make your product to, to share with others, you're not intending to profit from it, or maybe you are intending to profit from it. You intend to sell this product, okay? And so we'll, we'll hopefully take you down both uh, a path, no matter what the situation is in your algorithm here. So uh, before we get started, though, I definitely want to define what we mean by preparing, okay, so when we say we pr prepare our foods. And for the most part, when I say the word prepare throughout the presentation, I'm referencing that we are planning on processing, maybe canning, baking our, our food products, okay, so we're changing the original composition or state of the food, and it's no longer whole and uncut, okay, and so some examples would be Freezing is considered a process. Drying, milling, chopping. I'm just going to list a few so you can hone in if this is your situation with your products. Pasteurizing, blanching, you know, if you plan to freeze. Cooking, smoking, if you're making jerky or something of that nature. Mixing, packaging, dehydrating. You're adding ingredients. Okay, so USDA defines... Uh, the word processing, we won't get into that too much, but certainly uh, search for that if, if you want to see if what you're doing would would be considered preparing. And for the most part, if you're cutting or, or changing the original composition of food, you're probably applying here. So again, we're going to pick our path and we're going to keep going through the slides. So foods, uh, let's go down share. Share first of all. We're going to start with foods prepared to share. This category, again, is not for sale. Simple as that, really. And a couple examples would apply here to get us started. So 
and you know, if you're an extension, you might do this each season, really. So we might host a salsa making class, and participants take home their salsa. So we're we're making it together, and you know, whether it's in a, a commercial kitchen or not, and we'll define that here shortly. You are making this. You're gonna take it home and share it. Okay, you're not necessarily going to sell it when you take it home. Uh, also, you might have a potluck situation. I'm sure each of us know exactly, you know, have these commonly. So it's it's a cause organization, for example, or even not, but you're you're providing potluck style food. You're you're making it to share, but not to sell. Okay, so these situations don't require a a license or to be made in a commercial kitchen. Just a little bit more about share. So we want to remember. And, and this is important anytime you're preparing food, but to remember the basic food safety steps, and you know, and they are fourfold here. So these four steps are intended to prevent foodborne illness. They're recommended in all environments, whether you're at home or in a restaurant environment, or taking your product to to market and preparing it in a commercial kitchen. And these come from the Fight Back campaign. Uh, BAC stands for can uh, bacteria, so B-A-C, and so these are good to even teach your children as they're preparing snacks for themselves. So you want to start with a clean environment, and just a little bit of a review here on basic food safety. So you want your 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 all of your surfaces to be clean and your utensils to be clean, and we do this even as we prepare to make our salsa in our classes. So you know this step involves a, a few different steps. It's Cleaning away the biofilm or the food residue, you want to rinse it with potable water and even maybe sanitize. And you can mix your own sanitizer at home. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can take a gallon of water to a tablespoon of bleach, and it's just the right mixture to make a sanitizer at home so that it's safe for food contact surfaces. And in industry, we call that 200 parts per million of bleach or, or a little less, and you don't even have to rinse it away. Just let it dry. The danger zone, when we get into the, well, let's talk about cross-contamination first. So cross-contamination, and the easiest example I can give is you don't want to produce your raw hazardous products on the same surfaces, same cutting boards as your cooked, uh, you know, products. So it's a hamburger. You, you make up your patties on one surface, and you uh, take your patties off the grill, your hamburgers off the grill, and onto another surface. You don't want to cross-contaminate, so avoiding that. Notice these all start with C, so it's easy to remember. So I'll just plug through cooking and cooling quickly here as a review. So remember the danger zone as far as Fahrenheit temperatures is considered about 41 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you're talking about cooking and cooling, you always want to remember not only temperatures, but also respect for time. So 160 degrees Fahrenheit is where we want to target uh, to cook the center of red meats up to, and that includes pork, so that it instantly kills the microbes that can, can cause foodborne illness. And what we mean by that is you don't have to hold it at a certain temperature. You, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a respect for temperature as well as time, and, and it's important to, to monitor both of them. So just check out USDA's website, or you can also check out NDSU Extension's website for, for how long you hold red meat at certain temperatures when you're preparing it. And also cool. Cooling is important to prevent the growth of microorganisms, just like every other step, especially because our room temperature, what we're comfortable in, is right in the middle of the danger zone, right? So we have about two hours after preparing foods to get them into proper refrigeration if they're not shelf stable. And mind you, if, you know, and that's about room temperature. So if you're doing a picnic at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the summer or 90 degrees, you have a little less time than that. And again, that's an example of why time is very relative to temperature when it comes to food safety. So just some reminders as you're sh preparing food to share. Now, let's keep going unless I have any questions. Okay, I don't think so here. Okay, Julie, I'm not able to get past the, these slides here. Are you there? Huh. Let me see what's going on. Okay. 
Okay. If you could and so maybe you pull up the next deck All and I can right. keep talking here, forgive me. Okay, friends, so what we're gonna do if I'm pretty visual, so trust me, when we don't have uh visual it's hard for me too, but I'm going to switch gears now. We're going to go down the other path as we talked about the topics on the topic slide. We're either going to talk about for, for share or for sale. You know, the big thing today, we're going to talk about how you can take your product to market. So anytime you want to earn a profit from selling a food product, it needs to be produced in a commercially licensed kitchen. And that might sound a little overwhelming, okay? So it, it cannot be produced in a residential home. So in other words, you can't use the same kitchen for both purposes. You must seek a license. It also might be called a temporary permit or a permit or something. Um, whatever the, you know, but we like to use the word licensure. Now there are exceptions, and that's what I want to go over with you here today. So a, let's define commercial kitchen. I said that we would do it. Let's make sure we understand what we mean. Okay, here we go. Awesome, Julie. Let's keep going. Let's Let me get see. you there. Which one are you on? Alex? Sale. Right here, Julie, I think. Okay, thanks everybody for your patience there. So food's prepared for sale. And uh, I did basically read off this slide here. So we're just going to define commercial kitchen before we go on. So commercial kitchen has quite, you know, it has a few specific characteristics. The big things that Julie Wagendorf and Anton Sattler, my local health unit folks, um, and then Julie's of course across the state, tell me that you need a three compartment sink. You need one compartment at a minimum to wash, one to rinse, just rinse water, and to sanitize is the third, as well as a designated hand washing sink. So if you're thinking about taking a product to market and you don't follow under some of the exemptions here that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, you need at least four sink units to get going. Another basic requirement is that the floors, walls, ceilings, and, and sometimes even lights are smooth, sealed, and cleanable. So if you think even concrete, it needs to be sealed uh, and so that it's cleanable. Uh, your, your Lord, here's what I would recommend is that you, your local health unit is the first call that you make. If you need advice on if your kitchen applies, if you plan on building one, or renting a space, or even remodeling, just call your local health unit and I will get you to the right spot. Uh, it's very close to the end of this presentation when we talk about seeking a licensure. Chandra, so I'm going to stop we'll get you there. here briefly. Okay. Can you look up in your deck yeah. where it says follow? It should say the 20 out of 37 slides. Uncheck follow. Okay. Yep, it's unchecked. Okay. Try moving forward now. Yep, we're good. Okay, Julie, I think it's okay. I've got 21 no, out of 37 that's slides. That's not showing up for us when you can. advance it. You're seeing it, but if the follow button has to be checked for everybody else to see it. Okay. Are you able to see it now, friends? Now we're on 21. Very right. good. Very good. Okay. So uh, here we go. Let's keep going. Uh, ex exceptions for whole uncut produce. Okay. So here's the, we're getting into the first exception, and we'll call it an exemption. And when you are preparing your fabulous recipe, for commerce or for uh, for sale. Okay, so you are exempt from a license. You do not need to seek a license if you are, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, basically keeping your produce whole and you aren't cutting into it. So examples would be uh, selling sweet corn outside a convenience store like we see often in the fall. That's, uh, they could do that, uh, you know, as long as they have permission from the convenience store likely. You can set up a stand to sell potatoes or apples. No need to consult a regulatory body. Okay. Let's keep going with the exceptions here. There are exceptions for foods produced in the home in the state of North Dakota. Is really the scope that I'm staying within here. 
Um, so food products may be sold at community events. County fairs, to be specific, actually, nonprofit and charitable events, and community celebrations. Okay, food uh, farmers markets are a big, big part of an ex exemption. And, and on the next slide, you're going to see here the fact sheet that we wrote. Um, I, I have to give entire credit to the North Dakota Department of Health for helping us out to understand what's required to take a product to farmers market. Um, so we'll get to that on the next slide, but that's part of the exemption, and then also roadside stands. Okay, so um, so what it did cover, I do want to mention that in extension we have a big element of support, you know, responsibility support, and we enjoy supporting 4-H. 4-H is typically uh, covered under 501c3, so it's considered nonprofit. So. I did ask that specific question earlier this week when I was doing research for this. If you're doing something under your county's 4-H uh, umbrella, likely it's a nonprofit event. So you should be exempt from certain things. But of course, if you have any questions, call your local health unit. Um, so what doesn't it include now? Okay, so it does not include craft shows, food festivals, other for-profit events. Nor sales to other businesses. So anytime you wanted to sell something on the internet, so interstate, across state lines, or sales from one's home or business in general. So okay, we're getting into you know where do I land in in the exemptions? Do I you know do I apply for an exemption or do does my situation apply to it? Well, and then you can start getting a little frustrated when you're trying to figure out where you where you fit in. But remember that we're, the reason why we talk about this is we're trying to control the risk and prevent foodborne illness. So we, we want to be safe about taking our fantastic product to market. So um, the individual who's selling home processed, home canned, and home baked goods. So I think, you know, your, um, your Lepsa maybe or your excellent jelly. So under this exemption, should keep note that if you are exempt, you, we still are asking that you have available your recipe or pH results so that the regulatory body, if they swing by, they can see that, that you know what you're doing. So in North Dakota, you'll, um, it's nice to, to have those up because they give you some exemptions. But we still want you to label. We want you to label. So we're going to talk a little bit about those labeling um, requirements. OK, so here's the fact sheet that Julie Wagendorf's predecessor, Kennan, as Julie Garden Robinson introduced him, has written with his team. I, I bet, Julie, you were a part of this. Were you a part of this fact sheet draft? Hi, Chandra. That actually was drafted be, you know, before my time, but yeah, we use it um, together. Okay, currently great. To help the right, so this is current. This is what we want you to reference right now. So I, I referenced a couple what situations do fall under this exemption. And I did reference what it doesn't include. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more. There is a second page to this fact sheet. This fact sheet will be on the link, as Julie mentioned, if you take our survey. And then I think Bob had it in the chat box here. So if you scroll up in your chat box, you'll know where to find this fact sheet, OK? So, uh, so it's a good idea to have your recipe on display. So even if you apply to this exemption, we want you to have a sign up that says these canned goods, baked goods are homemade and not subject to state inspection. So you don't need a license. And also your food product should be labeled accordingly to the suggestion here on the right side of that slide. So these food products were produced in an uninspected home kitchen or major food allergies may also have been handled and prepared. Okay, you can read though the allergens there that are recognized by, by the US here. Um, so okay, so we will hopefully get through. I didn't read everything verbatim here, but we have a few examples we'll, we'll work through as we continue through. So this is what that fact sheet looks like. We do want to mention some of the exceptions or exemptions that that fact sheet you know, doesn't include. So again, we aren't 
allowing you to sell your product without a license at craft shows, at food festivals, or other for-profit events across the internet, and sales from one's home or business currently. Okay, certain foods that are not allowed under the exemption. So any, this was interesting to me, I, I knew about this fact sheet, but as I was researching again, any non-acidified foods, Processed by, so that is defined as pH of 4.6 or greater. So 4.7 would not meet it. 5.0, they're getting a little too, uh, a little less acidic. So not quite as safe when it comes to the control of microorganisms. So processed by either the use of a boiling water bath or by the use of home pressure cooker. So even if you are a savvy pressure cooker or canner. Um, note that this exemption doesn't allow you to sell that product at the farmer's market. Julie, is that correct? Julie Wagendorf. At this time, only low acid and acidified foods are allowed. So that is correct. Right. Thank you so much. So foods that require refrigeration, and this is very similar to those of us who are familiar with foods Exhibits in 4-H, foods that require refrigeration may not be sold under this ruling because they are higher risk. So custards, if they have a meringue topping, of course anything, you know, cream or even cream cheese, pumpkin, interestingly enough, and kuchen because there's cream in there. A couple examples, when you, if you, if we didn't list, you know, your, your product maybe feel free to call your local health unit and I keep uh, referring you to them. We'll get to how to find them here shortly toward the end when we talk about licensure. Again, continuing with foods not allowed under the exemptions on that fact sheet we showed you. Certain foods fall under regulatory jurisdiction and are not exempted by this ruling. So you may not sell fish, dairy, poultry, smoked fish, butter, raw milk, jerky, and any other potentially hazardous foods, or flavored oil. This is all in that fact sheet. Let's talk about something happy, right? So foods that you may sell, okay? Um, before I go on to the, the may sell here as you read that, I do want to mention something. When I talk to Anton, and he is the my local health unit, so I'm in Bismarck, in Burley, and he works for the, and he is the environmental health administrator. He works for the Bismarck Burley Public Health, uh, my local health unit here in Bismarck. And he said, you know, you might be asking yourself, why am I allowed under this exemption to sell product at a farmer's market, but I can't sell from my home? And some people get frustrated with that. But if you think of it this way, we're just, we're, we're trying to control the risk of foodborne illness. So it's kind of similar, as he put it, to fireworks. So if you can purchase them for a limited time, if they only a couple times a year, you know, over New Year's Eve or the 4th of July, uh, you know, we, we control that because we're controlling the risk because it can be dangerous. So you can't light them off all the time. And, you know, that's how we're viewing um, the farmer's market. Okay, so it's not all the time we're trying to control things and we're giving suggestions on how to label, for example. So from a consumer standpoint, I like that personally, not only because I like food safety, but truly as a consumer, I want to have faith that my the product that I'm eating is produced in a controlled and, and in a safe environment. Okay, so uh, let's see, let's keep going. So foods that are allowed, okay, so foods that are allowed, Basically, these are ones that are 4.6 or less in pH. So I do want to mention there is a caveat here, even if the foods are listed as examples here. And they, you know, are at the, the important thing is that they have to be 4.6 or less in pH. So sometimes tomatoes may test above 4.6 and are no longer out of that higher risk category. So, you know, I want to mention that you have the option at several of our county NDSU extension offices. My county is, is one of them. It's over 20 counties across the state of North Dakota, actually thanks to Julie Garden Robinson and, and her work with some grant money. We have pH meters in some counties. 
And so if, you know, typically how I manage it is I'm, I have the individual call and make an appointment because what does pH really mean? It, it can be kind of above, if you're not interested in the science but you want to do this safely, come to us and we can help you with it. We make an appointment and we like that for you to bring in a couple jars of your water bath can product per batch is, is ideal. And we like to see the recipe with source so that we can work through a couple things. We do charge $25, just cash or check payable typically to your county. And we are able to verify your, your product is safe to eat by opening it and doing a test. I do want to note that we are not your validation of, you know, we are not your processing authority to say, well, you know, you need to tweak this and that. We, we are just simply verifying that the end result is 4.6 or less. Julie Garden Robinson, would you like to add anything or does that kind of cover it there? Um, I just typed a couple comments and when you are making tomatoes, just a reminder to everyone that all of the formulations that we have for tomatoes and salsa have added lemon juice or ascorbic acid. And in your chat box, I also put the link to the publication that tells you the amount. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. That is perfect and I even thought about doing that too, so that was super efficient. And I say that because I get a lot of calls on this, especially during the growing season. And I love these publications because the, I'm not sure which one it is, maybe the bottom link is actually relative to locally grown tomatoes. It's local research. So it's super applicable to what you'd likely get your hands on here. Okay, so let's keep going. If we don't have any questions here on what exemption, you know, what you may sell. So also, we were talking about home can, but this slide says a little bit about home baked foods. So home baked foods that you may sell include but are not limited to lefsa, bread. Oh, we have a fantastic bread vendor here locally. Sourdough bread. Rolls, fruit pies, candies, confectionaries, cookies, and bars, okay? So baked goods you may sell. This is all in that fact sheet. Okay. So a little bit about the label. We saw it earlier on the fact sheet, which was a tiny bit grainy, I have to admit there. So I'll, I'll reference it again. If you sell under these exemptions, you must label. And labeling is important because, you know, if you weren't part of the process, I like to read labels. So um, the seller must display a sign or placard at the point of sale. So I'm going to use Bismarck as an example that we have here in Bismarck Mandan. Um, so the market does like to ensure that our vendors adhere to this fact sheet and we display this as you walk into the market typically at the front. And um, I'm not sure if each vendor has it actually. Jan is on. She might be able to type in and confirm that. And then not only at the point of sale you'll have a sign or placard, but each of your food containers should have this message on it. And you will see that at the market here. So I'm really proud of whoever created those guidelines with the market. And we have seen Anton swing through before, so he will he will keep an eye on us, and, and that's good. If we didn't have somebody to keep an eye on it, uh, things would probably wane. So no matter what the situation was, we have, ha have to have somebody to make sure we're staying up with it. So each food container, this message, these food products were produced in an uninspected home kitchen where major food allergens may also have been handled and prepared. So, and then we list the, those eight allergens. Other things that would be smart to have on your label, and you should include name of product, name of producer and contact information. So maybe it's the, you know, the roving donkey uh, uh, producer, which who is one at the biz market. Date pr product was made or canned is nice to know because we have the best quality within a year. And the ingredients are always good to share. Okay. So now, if you do not fall under, we're going down another path in the algorithm now. So you find that you do want to sell your product but the fact sheet doesn't cover you under an exemption. And that fact sheet really is targeted for farmer's markets. 
nonprofit events as well. But if you find that you want to sell and you need to seek a license, it's actually not the end of the world. And it's the right thing to do to, to make sure that we're staying safe. So you have to consider now which path you're going to take down as a licensure seeker. You're going to either go interstate with your com uh, with interstate commerce with your products, so across the internet would automatically take you into this category, or are you going to stay within state lines? Maybe you're just going to have your uh, go to the street fair in Devil's Lake and do this at two different events that they might have. I know in the beginning of the season they have a great um, old car show. Maybe you want to sell uh, food at that old car show in the beginning of the summer. Okay, so interstate commerce only, and you don't qualify for an exemption because your product might be higher pH or something of that nature. All right, well, uh, let's start with interstate commerce. Uh, as you go to seek a license, interstate commerce, yeah, you actually then fall under the big dogs, the, the federal requirements. So FDA does require on a biennial basis, so every two years that you register your facility, so that they know who and where, who is producing food products and where. So even when I was at, with General, or with Cloverdale, I had to register all of the plants where they produce product. And that way, FDA knew that we were selling product. And that actually came about with the Bio, uh, Bioterrorism Act. So the intention is to protect the public from a threat or an actual terroristic attack on the U.S. food supply which is unfortunately something that um, could happen. So they want to know who's producing food, and this is if you plan to go beyond the state lines. So anytime you're doing something maybe even on social media or inter um, across state lines on the Internet. Start with this link right here. When we have that link. These links aren't live. I need to know it probably. Um, and if you're able to open your browser and um, you know, type this in, note that you might be actually kicked off Blackboard. So maybe wait until you after and you'll get that link to, to after the survey. You can check this out. I am always available for questions. Okay, so now you stay within state lines and I have a little bit more detail for you here. So intra state commerce, this is where finally I give it to you. You can contact your local health unit for guidance. So I, I happen to love this link, and again, try this after the webinar here, but you simply go to, and Julie, thanks for this, Julie Wagendorf gave us this link. Um, what we mean by health unit is that, for example, in Bismarck here, uh, Anton is both covers Burley and Bismarck, so he's at the Bismarck Burley Public Health Unit, and on Fargo, it's Fargo Cass Public Health. So this gets you to who to call, whatever county you might be in within the state of North Dakota. So that's nice. Okay. Um, so just a couple things here. I'm going to use the Bismarck Burley as an example because I know what happens here in our county and city. Um, again, I recommend that if you want to get the specifics to sell your product within the state of North Dakota, click on this link after and you can find out the specifics in your area. So Bismarck Burley, we offer a temporary food license as well as a longer standing, so a mobile food license. And uh, yeah, a temporary is done annually on the calendar year. So January comes around, you might want to put a reminder in there that you need to do, you, you know, your, your temporary food license again. And it's about $75. It covers several events. So what you do in that application is you write down the events that you want to cover. Now locally it might be like you're going to do the Capitol Affair up here at the state capitol. Um, maybe you have an event at Buckstop Junction. Maybe you want to sell your product at Urban Harvest. Uh, maybe you include those three events where you plan to sell your product. You can also put in there and several others if you aren't sure exactly what your plans are. Um, so also you want to include what designated commercial kitchen you're going to produce your product in. That's the important note here. You need to have a commercial kitchen to produce your product. And so they have the opportunity to inspect your commercial kitchen to make sure that it's a, a safe choice for you to produce your product. So this is something where now you're in the licensure category. 
You can't just do it in your home kitchen. Um, also, you want to specify the foods that you're selling. So maybe it's nachos and carameled apples and, and, you know, cotton candy. So you would specify what you think you might be selling there. Um, so if you wouldn't apply under the temporary food license, which expires in a year, you might apply for that mobile food license, which locally for us is about $150 a year. This is just like a restaurant on wheels. So I think of the Eat Thai truck that's parked on Main Street east of town. Excellent Thai food, in my opinion. Uh, they have this type of licensure. Okay, so um, when we say local health unit, I just want to mention that we may be talking about city, county, public health units. You might be on a district. You might be, you know, having to answer to the state health department. So Julie used the example when I called her the first time a couple weeks ago. You know, every product is different. So when in doubt, call your local health unit. And, you know, maybe if you want to put 3% meat toppings on your pizza, at that point you might actually have to be inspected by uh, North Dakota Egg Department, you know, in the state. So it depends on the situation. Maybe you're taking a raw animal and you're making jerky, she says. Um, call. Call to see what your situation would be and where you need to be. So I use also an example of Burley County 4-H. We have a, a camper that we call that's been converted into a type of concession stand and we call it our chuck wagon. And every year we do get a temporary food license to sell food products at local 4-H events. I did mention earlier that um, typically if it's under, if it's considered a 4-H event, we don't need to because we're nonprofit. But sometimes we take that chuck wagon and support other events that aren't under, under the umbrella of 4-H. So that's why we need a license. All right. So hopefully that, do we have any questions here? Looks like we're doing okay. Okay. Just a couple more slides today. So really we're at the point in which we want to recap. So today's topic, we started with just sharing an, an overview with uh, general food safety, whether you're in a commercial environment or at your home. But then we talked about if you want to take your great recipe and, and actually start selling it. And you, you now you need to consider if you're going to be within the state or outside of state lines and, and market it on the Internet. And, you know, maybe there's an exemption. We have a big farmer's market exemption. And so we talked about a few of those. It does need to be a more of an acidified product. But, hey, when in doubt, call your local health units. You could even consult your extension office for pH verification if need be. All right. So just a review of what we've covered. And we do want to mention to you that currently North Dakota is in session. And there is House Bill 1433 that is a local cottage law or it's, it's pitching a cottage law, I guess, and hopefully I don't botch this here as I introduce it even. Um, but relating, it's, it, this, this, the bill itself is relating to the direct sale of food by the producer to a consumer. So it's really quite broad. And I'm going to tap Julie Wagendorf to basically just explain how the law is written. Thank you, Chandra. I can give you a review of House Bill 1433 um, from what I know about it. Uh, this is a House bill, so it was introduced um, into the House and heard by the Agriculture Committee in February. Initially, the House Bill uh, 1433, uh, the, one of the primary intents was to introduce the sale of raw milk and raw milk products um, into intrastate commerce outside of owning cow shares. And um, through, the, through the committee hearing process, uh, the bill has been amended to remove any sales of raw milk or raw milk products. And the part that is still uh, viable in the House Bill 1433 is what many other states that have similar types of laws refer to as cottage food law, um, sort of just a coined term. And where it's sitting right now is that the 
The bill still addresses direct producer to consumer sales of food, and it proposes change to Century Code Chapter 19-02.1, which is the North Dakota Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So this bill is proposing um, to allow the sale of cottage foods um, in state statute under the chapter 19-02.1, um, the, the North Dakota Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And so really, uh, how it's written currently may change. Uh, it needs to go through the Senate at this point. Um, it has not been scheduled yet. You can always go to the website nd.gov and look up the 65th legislative session and follow uh, this or any of these types of bills that are that are going through session at this time. And of course, it's all open to the public. At this point, the bill, uh, you know, the purpose of the bill, again, this is this is a, a little bit of subjective interpretation on my part. I wasn't directly involved in or asked to be involved in uh, drafting this bill. Uh, from from what I understand, it it is aimed at more uh, aligning uniformity throughout the state. So when we are talking about uh, whether or not home processed, home canned, and home baked foods are allowed for sale in intrastate commerce under certain venues and circumstances, uh, by putting it into statute would provide uniformity across the state so each individual jurisdiction may not um, differ from what the state statute um, explains. Uh, that um, being said, you know, they, we're, we're not through the session yet. There could be further amendments. I'm not aware of what those amendments, if they have already been proposed, I'm not aware of any. Um, sometimes laws are further amended after they're heard in committee based on testimony given. So that could happen yet um, in the next couple months. Really, how the, the current bill is written, uh, it just references food in general. Um, it, it's not changing the venues from farmers markets. Uh, let's see here. I'm just going to grab my reference sheet. It's not really changing a whole lot from what our fact sheet already states, other than it is including direct producer to consumer sales. Um, so I think that would open it up, you know, directly from um, the producer to the consumer and not just at a farmer's market or farm stand. Uh, also, I'm anticipating further changes. Um, it, it's not requiring any labeling at this point. I would not be surprised if the bill was amended to require certain labeling requirements. It's extremely important to inform the consumer consumer about ingredients for uh, anyone suffering from food allergies, um, as well as being able to inform the consumer. Based on how our fact sheet currently suggests um, that these canned uh, goods or baked goods are homemade and not subject to state inspection. Um, so whether that's just a tent, uh, a placard, or a label on each uh, product, the bill at this point does not require any of that labeling. Um, the other, otherwise, as far as a limitation of sales, um, it still would not include any transactions to involve interstate commerce, so that wouldn't change. Um, you would not be able to sell your products over state lines because, as Chandra already mentioned, that falls into FDA's jurisdiction, regulatory jurisdiction. Um, internet sales, be, because you can't really control where you're shipping product, that oftentimes is con controlled under interstate commerce. Um, not to say that you couldn't use Facebook or your websites to advertise and, and 
provide information to your markets in state, but you wouldn't be able to use the inner the internet um, to mail products over state lines for for retail. And you also wouldn't be able to sell any of your products to food, commercial food establishments or retail stores, which isn't different than than what we suggest now. So um, really, those are. That's really kind of, uh, a, I know it's a quick summary, but that really kind of gets down to where it's at right now. Um, and then we are just watching to see what uh, the Senate Agriculture Committee um, does when they look at this bill and if it's further amended. And um, we'll be available to answer any questions or provide education, consultation, as we always have been um, with, with moving forward as well. So if there is any other questions on this bill or kind of what's happening now, what, what might change, uh, you know, you can ask questions now or if you want to direct those questions to uh, Julie or Chandra, they can certainly get those to me and I can, uh, I'd be happy to have any further discussions or um, visit with anyone any more about this bill or in general. Uh, what the cottage food laws would look like in North Dakota. Yes, Julie, thank you so much. That was enlightening and good to know what's going on and to stay current. Uh, Jan, I had mentioned in the chat box on the bottom left here, just above where I put the link to the House Bill 1433. Thanks for mentioning this, Jan. She said local health units differ on regulations as well. So what I had mentioned as the example here locally with Biz Market, may not be the case in Devil's Lake, uh, as I used the example earlier. So what may be allowed in one county locale may not be allowed in others, and that's why it's important to use that link. Um, and let's see here now on this slide to find out who your local health unit is and who to call. Thanks, Jan. That's great. Any questions? Because that brings us to the conclusion of this week's this week's lesson or session. Let's go ahead and type any questions you have in the chat box, or if there's other information that you want to take a look at. Um, this is Julie Gr with all the Julies today. I um, I also wanted to point out on our Field to Fork website that we also have a, a little mini module that you can work your way through. So say you have an idea for a product and you're wondering where do I start, where do I go, we have that sort of information as well as a follow-up. Chandra, I think they're, they're letting you off the hook. I don't think there are any more questions. So, Right. I'd just like to thank all of you for coming. I hope you're, you join us again next week. And please go ahead and make use of whatever resources we have and let us know what else you need to help you. And I thank Chandra and Julie for um, providing today's lesson. So thank okay. you very much. It looks like we have one question here from Jessica since right. we have time. Jessica, please. Type in what you mean by CSA, so I'm not assuming. That's community supporting agriculture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Julie Gordon Robinson, do you have an answer for this one? I, I would actually recommend sitting in on um, Dr. Sikowski's session next week as well. He knows. And Jessica, if you want to follow up directly with me, yeah. um, just julie.garden robinson at ndsu.edu. I can. Uh, lead you towards some resources to help you with that. That's a, that's a webinar in itself, I think. Great. <laughs> right. so Good please, question. Please follow up with any of us. Um, we'll do what we can.
Any other questions? All right. I think this concludes our Wednesday weekly webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and thank you, presenters. Thank you.